So to some degree, this is a lab question and sort of a review question, but I want to be clear on it. Um, it's really, really important that we understand the... So a transfer function, we've been talking about this mass spring damper system, and so we have x over f, or more generally, we have out of s divided by in of s. The transfer function is a property of the system. So in the case of, for example, a mass spring damper system, it depends on m and k and b, and those things will not change. If this were an electrical system, it might depend on things like capacitance and inductance or resistance, but they're properties of the system that do not change. Once we have the transfer function, we can then take a bunch of different inputs and get different outputs. So if I took um, an impulse input, for example, and ran it you know, through G of S in some sense, kind of by multiplication or whatever, then out would come the impulse response. So if I had to do that symbolically, it would turn out that F of S for an impulse is just equal to one. And then I would multiply it, so x of s would just equal 1 times g of s. And then from there, I would do partial fraction expansion and inverse Laplace. And I would end up with the impulse response as a function of time, which you can do symbolically. Similarly, if I took a step input into the system, the output would be the step response. And so F step would just be one over S. And so X of S step would equal G of S over S. And again, I could take the inverse Laplace and do par partial fraction expansion inverse Laplace and get X step of t. But notice from here to here, f changed, my input changed, but my transfer function is a constant for a linear time invariant system. Um, similarly, if I had a fixed sign and I was trying to go after this symbolically, which you're not asked to do in the lab, but if you needed to, then f of s could be some amplitude times omega over s squared plus omega squared. So we're saying that f of t is equal to some amplitude sine of omega t. This is not the natural frequency of the system necessarily. This is not the damped natural frequency of the system. This is whatever omega we're choosing to drive the system at with our fixed sign. And so if we took that and ran it as an input to the system, the output would be x for some fixed sign. Um, we'd have to inverse Laplace it and all of that. Um, but again, the transfer function doesn't change. I draw one free body diagram, I write one equation of motion, and I leave f as temporarily a variable, and then later I'm substituting in three different values for f of s to get three different x of s's to then get the inverse Laplace to find x of t. So symbolically, it just means that I'm doing different stuff when it comes time to inverse Laplace and partial fraction expansion. Although there'll be some partial fraction expansion terms whose denominators are just the poles of my system and some that come from F. And so some of the poles will be the same. But the other option um, that I want to make sure we talk about is to talk about how to do this numerically. And so if I have the control module and I create G is equal to control dot transfer function. And I'm writing this out for now. We'll use a computer in just a second. And I send in a, a numerator and denominator list of coefficients. I then have options. Um, for example, control dot impulse response. And we can look at the help on that. It's going to take G as its first input. And I'm pretty sure it's going to take a time vector as its second input. And I'm pretty sure it's going to return T comma Y. Now that change in variables might seem a little weird. Um, when the Python control module talks about transfer functions, 
it's not assuming forces and displacements, so they generally use um, y of s as the output and u of s as the input. Again, it is out of s divided by in of s. And what we call those things is semi-irrelevant. But for our purposes to, to move back to the mass spring damper, this would tend to be f and this would tend to be x. Now where that gets especially confusing, so there's an impulse response function, there is also a control dot step response function that again takes g and t and returns t comma y. But beyond those two responses, if I needed to do an arbitrary response to an arbitrary input, there's a function called a function called forced response, which just means send in any input and get the corresponding output. But what happens is it would call it t comma u, and it would say that it would return t comma y comma x. And that's where they're using x and y both, which is pretty common in state space control language. Um, but that might seem a little weird since we had said, well, x was equal to y, now what is x? So if this were a mass spring damper system, y is your final output, which is x, which is your position or displacement. And then you remember that in lab we talked about a state space representation. Well, this would be a matrix that contains x1 and x2 if we have a second order mass spring damper system. And this would also then equal x1, where x1 is defined to be x, and x2 is defined to be x dot. So this combination of y and x I, I claim is a little bit confusing. y in the control dot force response is always an output, and u is always an input, and in our language that would make that f. So sorry if that's caused a little bit of confusion. But again, if I were to fire up IPython and import the control module, I could define an M, a B, and a K. Um, and again, just to be safe, I should double check that B critical is two times the square root of M times K. Uh, whoops, by which I mean the numpy dot square root. And so we are underdamped. And then my transfer function is control. Oops, that did not go well. I tried to use tab completion, but it wasn't ready for me. Control dot. Seriously. Somehow this is a markdown cell and not a regular cell. OK, so g is equal to control dot transfer function. There we go. And I was going to say of num comma den, but I'm just going to go 1 comma should be a comma, m comma, b comma, k. So those are coefficients of powers of s. It's 1 over ms squared plus bs plus k. And like I said, I could now say t comma y imp is equal to the control dot impulse response of g comma t, except that I have not defined t yet, and so it'll get mad at me. So let me insert a cell above where I define t to be the np dot a range of 0 comma 1 comma 0 1 0 1. Sure. And then I could get a figure and I shouldn't need to clear it so I will plot uh, t comma y sub imp um, looks like I could use a little bit longer time period given my damping. And so I'll do that. And I could then also throw on there an X label that is time in seconds and a Y label I'm going to call impulse response. y of t.
Okay, so without having to create a new transfer function, I could also say t comma y step is equal to the control dot step response. And again, g comma t in. And then I'm going to copy and reuse some of these things and make some minor changes. And so this will be the step response. And the key difference there is that the impulse response comes back to zero and the step response ends up at one over K. And I can go in and add some more comments and document this if I want it to be a better example to you. But if I said that my amplitude is equal to one, that my input freak was let's say one Hertz. So Omega is two times the NP dot pi times freak. And so F would equal A times the sine of omega times T. Um, I could then say T comma y, y sine comma X is equal to the control dot forced response of G comma T comma F. And I forgot to put an NP right there. And again, I could get myself a figure and plot some stuff. And so let's go with Y sine and call this a fixed sine response. Uh, but let's also plot T comma F. Hmm, and because I've made a relatively poor choice of K, the output, I was more careful about this in the lab. So let's come back over here and make that smaller and make that smaller. But now I've made a much slower system. Okay, and it turns out um, that I'm above the natural frequency, and I know that because my output is 180 degrees out of phase with my input. So making these numbers up off the top of my head is perhaps not super effective. Um, and so let me at that point get a new time vector. Um, and I guess if I was going to give you a pro tip, I would say that I want to do uh, the period of this would be 1 divided by F. And then when I go to create my sine vector, I might do like five periods. And then my DT might be 0 0.1. Uh, let's just go with 100 times F. So I'm going to do 100 times faster than whatever my input sine wave is for five periods. Uh oh Oh, whoops. So this is supposed to be freak. And this should also be freak. Oh, right. And you would do all of those things before you define your input vector. And I'm totally failing at this. That's awesome. Um, okay, I found my problem. Um, I've got, I wanted to have a sampling frequency that was 100 times faster than the frequency of my sine wave, which is a good idea. But this needs to be dt, not my sampling frequency. So I'm going to define sampling frequency like so. And then my dt needs to be 1 divided by the sampling frequency. And then that needs to be dt. There we go. And so there's five periods um, at 100 times the sampling frequency for that particular frequency. Um, and then you could go in and relatively easily make a new one. I think we showed that 1.0 is 
Hmm. Funky looking and not quite above what we're looking for. What about two hertz? Hmm. Um, and maybe five periods is not enough for those guys. I think the other thing that's going on is this is so lightly damped that the homogeneous solution is kind of hanging on for a while. Um, hopefully the example, the values that I gave you in the lab lead to better results. Um, but you get the idea. I can have one transfer function. You notice that I've only ever defined one transfer function in this script and I can find the impulse response and I can find the step response and I can find an arbitrary response to an input vector that I make up.